Yeah, hello everyone, and I'm very happy to see all of you here. Yeah, and as already mentioned, today we will talk about interview processes. So, yeah, who is uh, this guy speaking today? Um, my name is Sergey, and I usually like to tell about myself that I'm kind of multifunctional software engineer because it's 21st century, what not to come up with fancy titles. Um, and I'm also, why I'm presenting this myself because I'm not only doing kind of software engineering stuff, but also a lot of things that surround it. And if you want to connect to me or ask some questions, you have contacts over there. So during the interview process, I've seen a lot of things usually from other side. Usually I am kind of the person who is interviewed by somebody. But now I started to be in the position of the person who needs to interview and give some assessment about the candidates. And I started at some point to think uh, what good interview should look like, what the process should look like. It's like analyzing problems with uh, which we kind of come up with and what fixes kind of we applied. And about this talk, the goal, about this goal, if you will have a question in your head after this talk, like do we have a good interview process in our company? I think uh, I achieved kind of something that I wanted today for this talk. So if you will come even tomorrow at your work and start, and start to do some changes, even to the process, it will be even better. And of course, a little bit disclaimer, like in the movies, uh, this talk is based on personal experience, so apply some scientific filter, we're also today in uh, university, and uh, apply some suggestions or what we will talk about uh, to your environment kind of carefully. So let's start with a story time. So once upon a time, team of engineers was asked a question from a manager, like who wants to help with interviews? And uh, only one hand raised up, and I think you already knew know who was it. Uh, and at some point it was kind of, this was beginning of an end at some point. At some point it was already like this. So you're like sitting and everything is kind of burning around. So why this happens, let's talk a little bit about some facts. So more than 200 interviews were in total done by our kind of team in a roughly like five, six months period. More than 120 interviews were done only by this person standing here. Uh, so this means that on average it's like 12 interviews a week or it's up to four or five interviews in some days. So crazy stuff kind of happening. Um, interviewed, of course, boys and girls, people from around the world. And why we could afford so many interviews? Because all interviews were done kind of online. Why this crazy stuff happened? So the first thing, a uh, new big shiny project was on the horizon. It was really big, so workforce was needed. And because it was so big, company also decided, oh, why not to open office in new location? Uh, and again, because of this project, company also committed to provide a lot of engineers uh, before the end kinda, of this year. So that's why kinda, this stuff started to happen. So a, a little bit recap already on this point, and I think that you already see these kind of huge numbers, and I think you already questioned that something is kind of wrong here, and I think it, it was. So in my opinion, like don't sign contracts uh, where it's specified how many people you should provide to other companies, because you only need so many developers uh, if you, I don't know, creating really, really something big, but your success of your project it's not about amount of uh, people, but about quality of the work done. So let's start to talk about the interview process. So in the beginning, interview process was very simple. 
We had some agencies, so company worked with some agencies that uh, f trying to search for developers. Then we basically have an interview when we receive uh, some CVs. And if everything went kind of successful, we proceed to the offer phase. So super fast uh, process. So what happened during this interview was we just check that the person knows something, some general questions, talking about technology, etc. And interview is only one hour long, so it's, uh, of course, on obvious, it's not impossible to understand everything about person in this kind of time. But we kind of try to, why this happened? Because no experience kind of in doing such stuff. So recap at this point. The first thing, I think this schema kind of might work only if agencies invite people that are really what you expect, which is obviously impossible because you are telling them something they understand and interpret as they understood it, and you receive candidates that maybe you do not want to have in uh, your case. So, a lot of the kind of difficulties. Interview process is very short, and people do not expect to get offer right away after kind of first interview. For them, it's like, what happened? We ex usually expect like uh, five interview process or three interview process. And they're already s thinking that something is wrong here. And because interviews are very simple, it is also difficult to check that it is not a cheater in front of you. And what about, and about cheating? We'll discuss a, bit, a little bit later. And Many, many interviews kind of coming because they are short. You can, you know, management trying to push, okay, interviews are one hour long, then we can have like four or five interviews in one day. So it kind of started to burn out. So now we are approaching the middle phase. Now we have all steps from the beginning, like only this three step uh, interview process. But we also added additional team members to interview, to participate from time to time. Because I already, so the situation was something like this. And another thing is that we added at this point and it changed kind of a game for us. It was a classification of the candidates. And what is this classification? So all our candidates were classified in the following categories like juniors, middles, and seniors. We use these kind of emojis in our Slack channels to identify them, so we can also use them from now on. Um, so how we do this classification? We had two main characteristics. The first one is overall technical impression. So usually this answers such questions like, what does person present as a specialist? How broad is the knowledge? What they used, how they work, etc., etc. So for junior, for example, we expect that candidate in this category will be fluent in the terminology. So basically it knows something, it uh, knows what's happening in the industry, etc. For middle, we expect depth of knowledge. So we want to see, uh, so what this means, if you tell me what technologies you used and, uh, for example, interviewer asks some specific questions, maybe not so kind of deep question about some technology, we expect from you very kind of good, experienced uh, answer. And for seniors, we wanted to see that candidate know how to build things, like from scratch. So he sees from what part system should consist, uh, and have kind of knowledge about different areas. The second thing is self-sufficiency. I think these are kind of s very simple and uh, self-explanatory. So for juniors, they basically require help from teammates, and we understand that. Middles, they are independent and gay, they can do already stuff on their own. Seniors are independent and they already know how to guide teams. So at this point, we started to fix the second problem. So we already started to classify our candidates and understand who is in front of us. 
We also created framework with questions to help us to classify who it, who it is in front of us. It's junior, it's middle, or it's senior. And because uh, we have kind of explanation of who we are expecting for junior or middle or senior, we created kind of profiles or avatars. I think if there are some person here from marketing, they are familiar with these kind of terms. So what you basically create here, you try uh, to describe for yourself, for your company, who is for you junior or who is for you middle developer or who is for you senior one. And you send these kind of descriptions to people who help you with finding people. But we are still getting a lot of candidates that do not fit our expectations and uh, we wanted to fix that. So we are approaching this middle phase too. So we still have agencies, we still have interviews and offer phase, but we added an additional CV screening on our side. And really that thing helped us to reduce number of kind of not fit for us candidates. And what I want to tell that this agencies and internal CV screening process should work as machine learning training, you know, because you do internal CV screening, you can send a feedback back to agencies that, for example, this is not fit and agencies can align with you. And uh, I think the, if you're kind of familiar with uh, some machine learning or heard something, there was something like back propagation algorithms and something like this. So here you see also the same thing. So you kind of, they're feeding something inside, you're responding, no, this is not fit. Uh, something is aligned and the agencies start to work also better kind of for us. Um, what also we added in the interview, we added core review questions and open-ended questions. So what they are and uh, what we try to solve with them. So code review. So I've talked uh, that it's sometimes impossible to find out, to figure out the cheaters kind of in front of you. So what kind of cheaters? Like they talk nice, seems like they know a lot of things, but on practice, when they start to do something, you realize that they don't. So that's why we have these code review questions. And how we usually approach to them, we just ask, have you ever done a code review? And usually all of us uh, done code reviews at some, some point. Um, and what we usually give, it's a piece of code for the review, very, very small and very short. So this is code not with some legacy method or big functions with 100 lines of code that you don't want to review on your pull request. Uh, so consider following example. It's very simple, five lines of code. And the questions that we are usually asking here is, what problems do you see here? From this moment, you kind of lean back and listen. Of course, kind of before giving something like this, uh, you should also understand kind of what is wrong or everything is correct in this code, right? And believe me, after, for example, giving this kind of example, you receive many different answers on this question. Okay, open-ended questions. They're usually questions which are without kind of correct answer. And with these questions, you are trying to figure out how candidates think. So again, the main job here of interview is to listen. For example, such questions like, what do you love or hate about some specific technology? For example, I usually ask, uh, like to ask, uh, what do you hate about something? If person, uh, well, for example, working with Java and he knows Java very well, usually the question like, what do you hate about Java? Uh, can bring you the ideas of how deep uh, this person has worked with this technology because he knows about some struggles and problems. 
even if he liked this technology. Or something like this, like you've implemented a feature, how you will make sure that it's working as expected? Also a very broad question and you can answer it from different uh, points of view. So recap at this point. So we dropped our like kind of false positives with the candidates with this kind of uh, questions. So cheaters are also recognized better, but we still have a problem to figure out seniority. Because uh, uh, as I mentioned previously, senior is about T-shaped knowledge and architectural intuition. And we're basically approaching to the current state of how things are working. So same procedure, but we added another kind of branch to check seniority in some cases. And what we do, we come up that it's better to give a homework. They review it. And if we liked how it's done, we invite candidate to the second interview, basically to discuss this homework. So about homework. So the main thing is task when you give a homework should be simple and it should be real, somehow connected with your environment and what you do. You also should describe mandatory and additional requirements if you have such. So for example, you want them to implement function to sum up two digits, like design API for this function, output should be one digit, we want to save information about uh, operation execution in some storage, and uh, I want that this function to be packed in a Docker container uh, to act as a cloud function, for instance. Uh, with such points, we get already a lot of information. For example, like, do they read requirements? How they understand them? Do they ask questions about these requirements? Do they try to figure out something? And because we give a framework, we also need somehow to set a deadline, right, where we want to have this homework back. And at this point, for homework, we are giving control of time to the candidate. Why? Because they also are humans, they have things to do. Uh, they have families, some other responsibilities. And most important, you want to make them comfortable. That's why after they will make this homework, send it to you, you will look it kind of through. Discuss homework in the second interview. Talk about it, like why they, what decisions were made like this, why they implemented some functions like or classes like this. Uh, and if you see that homework were done kind of badly and you understand that you don't want to, to invite person to the second interview, send feedback. Always send some feedback, not just, okay, well, you are not uh, what we are searching for but really some good feedback like uh, we found this kind of function and it's not good design or whatever. So person uh, could learn something, could understand what was wrong and make itself a better developer. They worked and most uh, of developers, they kind of worked hard to finish this kind of homework and People deserve feedback, and this also show your respect. For example, for me, when I'm interviewed and I do not receive kind of feedback, I feel a little bit deceived, and the company is kind of blacklisted in my list straight away. So I think some questions that might come up here, but what about life coding, right? It's such a good thing to do life coding. So in my opinion, this is what I usually think about live coding. In my opinion, live coding interviews should be dead at some point. Because in the end, they really show nothing. Why? Uh, how many of you here, I think many of you are here like uh, engineers or somehow connected, how many of you are uh, associating themselves as an introvert? Yeah, so, yeah, kind of a lot. So, we as usually, how developers kind of work. 
if we will look at ourselves. They don't want to talk and explain what they are doing in place right now. They want to explain and discuss maybe after they implement it. What engineers do more? Do they read or they write? I think they read more because we're reading more code, we're reading some code reviews, and everyone is also unique. So one person can solve your problem very fast, second is slower, first one needs some piece uh, of paper to solve this, second doesn't. And basically it is a uh, not safe thing to do. But if you are if you are searching for engineer, in my opinion, this is not kind of a very safe thing. But if you are searching for a kind of hacker person who go to job, take task, figure it out on its own uh, and implement, solve this problem, and that's all kind of without understanding the whole picture of your project, then I think this kind of stuff is okay because they will just do everything very kind of fast as on some uh, platforms uh, for interview, code interview preparation. Also some people say that we check in these interviews how you can collaborate. And this is kind of the common thing to, for the answer. But it's usually fake. Interview don't write code with you, right? It just looks on what you are doing and uh, maybe sometimes try also to help you. Sometimes even developers who are asking to do this code interviews um, don't understand completely the problems that you're trying to solve because they just got this paper from somebody else. So not, not very safe. So recap, at this point for the whole interview process, have a list of requirements for yourself. What do you expect from the candidate? Maybe also create this kind of avatar or picture of your ideal candidate. Also, don't send junk, some info to agen agencies. Yeah. Also, try help to them understand better your needs. Um, tell candidate about your hiring process because respect your time. Because for some developers are not interested in uh, seven-step interview process because they understand that it's it's a lot of time for them. Yes, in our case, homework was only for seniors kind of because we try to understand how they can create stuff. And in overall timing of this process, even with the homeworks, is usually kind of less than a week, so it's still kind of very fast, but we understand many kind of things. And for us, live coding interviews kind of didn't work well. So now I want to talk about the candidates, what you can do maybe better, and then about the interviewers. So about the candidates, I will start maybe with some basic points, but it's good to remind everyone. So the first thing that was a problem kind of for us is know the language in which you will speak. So if you are applying for English speaking job, you, you should know how to talk in English. Uh, check that your hardware or software is kind of working before the interview. The otherwise there will be like a lot of reschedules because something is not working, drivers are not installed, etc., etc. Also, it's a good thing to refresh some fundamental knowledge because uh, usually after university we are not applying uh, some stuff. Uh, we are kind of applying in practice, but we're already starting to forget some theoretical basis. And also talk. Uh, don't just answer maybe questions uh, with one sentence, but try to talk more because uh, we do not have ability to read your mind. Uh, and interviewer will know where to stop you, kind of. So talk as much as you kind of can. About the resumes, let's talk about what not to include in uh, resumes because we already know what should be included but it's more interesting what not to. Uh, in my opinion these things like birthdays, marital status, gender and some kind of GDPR stuff should be not present in your resume. Why? Because it really doesn't matter. It should not matter for the interviewers. But uh, as we heard on the previous talk uh, some people still are looking, for example, for 
uh, your when you, for your age, and they're like, no, we don't want to hire that person. It should not be the case. Yeah, so hide this information, and uh, because it's really not relevant for you as for a specialist. And also for engineers, what gotta, uh, I've spot, don't include information like list of technologies. Uh, this is something like controversial. And here is a such thing. Usually, it doesn't matter in what you implemented something. Uh, but you can be declined by somebody who is doing CV screening just because your, for example, list of technologies consists of too many legacy stuff, for example. So list of technologies can hide your potential as an engineer, in my opinion. So better, it would be better for you to add a list of technologies with which you enjoy to work. Not just all technologies that you kind of worked in your lifetime. Or a list of technologies that you would like to work because you find them kind of interesting. Um, if you have uh, something that you want to share, even maybe some small achievements, uh, basically tell what you did in this company. Maybe you improved something, or your coworkers now feel th themselves better, whatever. If you uh, have some numbers, add these numbers, because usually people who like do CV screening, you know, everyone likes numbers, so. Yeah, tell what you really want and how you can be also helpful, because sometimes from the curriculum it's, uh, we understand that you are familiar with this, this, and this, but we don't understand completely how you can be very helpful for us. And make your resumes maybe a little bit interesting, not, not like Europass or simple black and on white. Mm. Why? Because many recruiters receive many CVs. Something should stand out. Maybe some interesting facts. Maybe this CV is represented somehow differently. Maybe just add some colors, really. We're in the 21st century. A lot of resumes are now viewed on tablets, phones, computers. Ink is not a problem now. So there's no reason to do resumes just black and white. And this is also one interesting that I haven't found uh, in a lot of resumes, add references from other people, like really text from other people. It will add more value to yourself if uh, there is some reference from real person from with which you worked with that telling something about you. It will sell you kind of better. So recap at this point for the candidates, be prepared for the interview, refresh some basic knowledge. Think about your resume from the point of uh, person where you want to apply. So what you want them to see in it? Just a bunch of information? Or they want to get some value from this? OK, now interviewer. So the main job for the interviewer that I figured out is basically listen to your candidate. This is the main job. Listen, be focused. This is your main thing. Don't go away or in your phone. It's something kind of disrespectful in the first way. And you can also lose some valuable information. Also, help your candidates. If they forgot some name of technology or some word while they are talking, help them out. They are under stress. For everyone, stress level kind of is completely different. And I think our job as an interviewer, make your candidate feel safe and more comfortable. Um, also, don't bomb candidates with questions. Just question, question, question. Try to make natural conversation and find some line and tie into it your questions inside. And don't be aggressive because usually all these interviews are happening somewhere uh, during your job and you might have some conflict situations. It's not their problems. Try to go some away before the interview. Calm yourself down. Maybe also slow your speed of speech. And 
be a kind of good person. Another thing, um, this is also a little bit maybe controversial, but don't ask candidates to introduce themselves. Why? They already sent you a resume. They already introduced yourself. So when you are asking candidates to introduce themselves, some of them might think that you have not read the resume and you're just trying to catch up very fastly during this first interview on the background of the candidate. And also for some candidates, this is kind of a red flag that they, they're, they're, they are not trying to understand their candidates or they don't read information, so they are doing their job very not good. And please, please don't use Skype for the interviews, kind of, because uh, now I think Skype is mostly installed for the interviews by a lot of people and uh, it's uh, also there are some a lot of problems so use something that works maybe mainly in the browser kind of, and has only kind of one dependency on for everyone so in summary interviews are really not simple and they require a lot of kind of human energy and resources and at some point they start also to kill your engineers so it's all good to have rotation so you should have some group of people who are rotated because if only one person interviews kind of everyone at some point if it will feel really bad and learn to listen it's not only applied for the interviews but uh, in life in general learn to listen you will understand person a lot better what also can help is create some framework for the interview. So like maybe some questions that should be answered and you will understand uh, in what category this candidate falling in. And this framework also can be shared across your interviewers. So you would have uh, the same approach for all the candidates. Also a good thing is to keep your mind cold because you are working, you are asking questions and you are talking to the specialist. Whenever who is sitting in front of you, you're talking with a specialist and try to assess a specialist. And of course, respect people who you interview. And I think this is kind of all what I wanted to share today. So if you have questions, 